Hello and welcome to IDF's virtual education event, COVID-19 and what comes next. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kathy Antela. I'm the Vice President of Education at IDF and I will be your, your host for today's virtual event. So now I would like to welcome our CEO and President of IDF, John G. Boyle, to personally welcome you. Hello, everybody. And uh, if you can hear Kathy and me and you can see us bobbling our heads a little bit, then uh, you are uh, a okay to go uh, from here on out. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you here today, uh, especially because uh, this was a little bit of a uh, transplant from what was supposed to be an in-person event in the New York area uh, to obviously now a virtual event. And uh, as uh, many of you uh, on the phone are from <clears throat> the greater New York area, uh, which uh, of course has been so impacted, um, we know that this has been a real journey for you. And so uh, we're really, really, really glad that you're here. Uh, so it is lovely to see everyone and uh, thank you for uh, taking part in uh, this, uh, the, uh, the next in what is a kind of a, a pilot series of uh, virtual events that we've been doing uh, here at IDF. Um, these virtual events, uh, you know, are important not only for where we are today, since being in person is very, very ill-advised, um, but also important for where we're going to be going in the future, because we really believe that this approach is going to help us to uh, ultimately enable us uh, to help more people within the PI community. Uh, so this is uh, maybe not the only thing that we're going to be doing in the future. We do want to get back to having some in-person things, uh, but it is going to be a big part of it. And so your feedback <clears throat> as to what you experience, what you want to see, uh, is really, really, really important. These are not one-offs. These are things where you can help to guide us. So um, we're going to be sending out an evaluation uh, via, I believe, uh, email uh, not too long after the event. So please do take a couple of minutes uh, and just give us some feedback. Tell us what worked. Tell us what could be uh, better, because that will allow us to know exactly how it is that we proceed in the future, uh, because we are your organization. Your needs are the only reason why, um, why we exist. So please do uh, share any and all thoughts that you have. Um, because this is your uh, ultimately your event, um, you know, we programmed it based on what it is that you have been asking of us at IDF. Um, and so we've created uh, a, um, a program here that really was uh, done in conjunction uh, with our presenter's input uh, to create a session that uh, you know, we hope uh, will uh, highlight a lot of your uh, most pressing questions uh, surrounding COVID-19 and the impact on our community. Um, so as you can see, uh, you know, here we have um, uh, IDF's mission statement, which you all should know by heart. You can, you know, uh, put your right hand over your heart and, and recite it, uh, uh, you know, during the break. Um, but we also have things that we have not really highlighted as much uh, in the past, which are our core values, our guiding principles, and our constituent promise. Uh, and as you are our constituents, uh, uh, this is our promise to you. Um, and we try to weave in elements of as many of those as we can into all of our programming, uh, but especially this one where uh, the issues of innovation, of, of bringing you the uh, you know, questions you're most interested in, um, you know, and uh, using trusted resources, uh, uh, some uh, uh, physicians who uh, we know and uh, and love, uh, you know, who are coming here, um, know that this is really how we make our decisions, how it is that we uh, move forward when we see that there is a need in our community, and we really bounce it off of uh, these three different buckets uh, to make sure that we are doing the sort of job uh, that we want to do. So, um, you know, from our core values all the way to our constituent promise, uh, we want to make sure that we have as much of this as possible. And I think that you're going to be in for um, a lot of those elements here this evening. So, uh, with all of that said, and that's a lot, uh, because, hey, they haven't shut my microphone off, um, I would like to thank the sponsors of this event. Uh, this includes our core service leaders, CSL Bearing. Uh, Griffles and Takeda, our core service sustainer, Horizon Therapeutics, our national sustainer, 
a credo. Our national patrons, Diplomat, Diplomat Specialty Infusion, Kedrion Biopharma, CVS Specialty, Corum CVS Specialty Infusion Services, Coru Medical Systems, and Kaba Fusion. Thank you to all of our sponsors for providing us the resources that we need for this and for all of our uh, other programming that we are doing in support of the community. So on to uh, the next slide here, because once this meeting is over, well, you, you know, you can only do these every now and again, and you're going to have, you know, a bunch of other hours in the day to, you know, fill your time. So why don't you go online and uh, make sure that the fun and learning do not stop. Um, our website, primaryimmune.org, has uh, an enormous number of resources, uh, including publications, online support groups, uh, and you'll always be able to see uh, updates about uh, up, uh, upcoming events. Um, you can get help with situations that are maybe unique to you, uh, advice on insurance issues, and of course, lots and lots more. Now, if you haven't already, I do hope that you will uh, make sure that you connect with IDF and me, if you've found me online, uh, through social media. Uh, and uh, really, because we know that everyone absorbs information differently, we put all sorts of different uh, information out there in a, a variety of different channels. So uh, find uh, the one or five or six uh, channels that work best for you uh, and do make sure that you uh, stay up to date. Uh, usually it's just for uh, things that are interesting uh, and you might find useful, but sometimes there's something pretty important that we want to make sure that our community knows about. Uh, so if you're in touch with us via all these different channels, you will never miss out. So, um, because it is the 4th of May, uh, those of us who are Star Wars fans, and I have seen all nine movies in the theater, of course, that first one, um, I was kind of not as present as I would like to be, it's kind of in the womb. Um, you know, uh, I, I, my family are big Star Wars fans, and so I want to make sure that I say and am hopefully not the first to say may the fourth be with you um, we believe that in addition to the learning and to uh, the connection that we should all have a little bit of fun to lighten things up uh, and so uh, in addition to uh, baby yoda and uh, not so baby yoda and then uh, a lot of folks from the uh, prequels there uh, you will probably see a little bit of uh, star wars uh, themes in the, some of the slides to come so uh, please bear with us we're just going stir crazy at idf uh, same as you so this is how we uh, let it all hang out a little so with all that said, uh, let's get on to the stuff that you're really, really looking forward to, uh, the presenters. And so I would just like to say one final thank you for being part of our community, uh, especially as the world around us uh, continues to change. Uh, and we hope that your participation will not only um, here inform you and be helpful, but maybe help you to better serve uh, others within the PI community as well. Uh, this knowledge is, is not to be kept, it is to be shared. So uh, thank you all for being part of this. And now let me turn it right back over to my colleague, Kathy. Kathy, it's all yours. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for your wonderful welcome. And as a reminder to everybody, um, we're going to have the opportunity to speak with our sponsors at the end of um, the meeting today. And now before we begin our medical presentations, I do want to share a quick disclaimer. IDF understands that the COVID-19 pandemic is a rapidly evolving situation. So we do encourage you to check our website often for updates. Also, please remember the information presented during this event is, is not medical advice and it's not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So rather, we're here today as a trusted source and a friend to provide you with information that can be used to help you Okay. So now I would like to hand the stage over to our first medical presenter. 
Dyreek is board certified. in the departments of pediatrics and medicine at NYU Langone Health and treats patients at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill. So welcome, Dr. Parikh. Thank you. Um, I just wanna make sure, okay, good, I'm not muted anymore. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I know this is a topic that's on everybody's mind, um, and especially, um, you know, those who have primary immune deficiency for, you know, very obvious reasons. So, you know, today we're going to um, touch on COVID-19 and primary immunodeficiency. Um, you know, as, you know, prior speakers have said, this is a rapidly evolving situation, and it's one of the few times where we're actually learning about an illness while we're treating it. So, um, everything, you know, that we'll be telling you, you know, take as a grain of salt that it could very easily change in the next week or two. But um, hopefully I can give you a little bit of an overview of what it means for the PI patient and um, what it means from an immune system standpoint. So not to get too technical, uh, you know, or, or too, um, you know, basic science, but, you know, understanding uh, how this virus affects the immune system can be a little bit helpful. And it may even, uh, in some ways, um, provide reassurance too. So what do we know about this virus and how it affects our immune systems? Um, what we do know is that those who are infected with the virus from uh, recent articles that have come out uh, have shown that you know, they do have profound lymphopenia. What does that mean? So basically very low T and B cells are circulating. Um, and what we know that it's not only just a quantity problem, but it's also a quality problem. So many of you that suffer from PI understand this uh, more than the general population, that it's not always the numbers that matter, but the function. So what we're also seeing is that a lot of um, these patients, too, not only have, may have lower numbers of the T and B cells, but they are showing signs of what we call exhaustion or um, fatigue. So you, as you can imagine from how that sounds, uh, you know, a lymphocyte or a T or B cell that's not functioning as well, obviously that poses a challenge when you're trying to fight off of a, a virus. But the interesting thing about this virus is that it's not so much the infection that is uh, the biggest threat to people. It's actually the inflammation that comes along with it. And I'm sure all of you have heard throughout you know, the endless media stories about cytokine storm. So interestingly enough, you know, this virus, uh, when it infects someone, not everybody, but in some individuals, it can cause a, a huge release of inflammation and, and it causes all different types of uh, cytokines to be released throughout your body. And this can be very, very dangerous and very deadly and can affect almost every organ system. So interestingly enough, um, you know, even though you're being infected, uh, we're also having to deal with the kind of side effect of this virus of battling large, large amounts of inflammation. And it's that inflammation um, that is what makes people extremely sick in these cases and can lead um, to multi-organ failure. So across the board, um, we're seeing very, very low numbers of these circulating cells, uh, whether it be um, CD4 T cells, CD8, or natural killer T cells. Now, you know, why is this important? Now, all of us need our natural killer cells to help us fight off viruses. And so as you can imagine, when they're low um, in very infected people, uh, it can be even more difficult to fight them off. Further, uh, we're also seeing low numbers of B cells, and as many of you know, are the ones that are responsible for making antibodies, especially, and also other uh, types of cells as well, such as eosinophils, neutrophils, monocytes, basophils, all of these are very, very important uh, in fighting infections. And the quality, as we had mentioned before, is also affected of a lot of these cells, especially those that help us fight the viruses, the natural killer cells. So what does this mean for PI patients? I know that sounds extremely scary. Uh, all my um, you know, cells are low. How am I gonna be able to fight off this infection when I already have a weakened immune system uh, compared to the general population? 
Well, like everything in COVID-19, um, the data is limited and it's still evolving. And I know that's very frustrating for everybody to hear, but especially um, someone in the PI community who knows that they're more prone to getting sick, they're more prone to infection. Um, the good news is we have an international registry that's collecting information on PI patients and various immunologic societies from all over the world are doing this. Um, as of April 10th, and now there might be more now, uh, we had 15 patients that were in the registry um, with PI. So three of those had phagocyte defects um, or you know things such as chronic granulomatous disease. Uh, six had uh, CVID and uh, a other antibody deficiencies. Um, two had cell-mediated deficiencies. Three were in the inflammatory category, and one of them um, is unknown. It's not classified. Um, but what we found was that the immune-deficient patients have a lot of the same symptoms and severity. And the severe disease um, was more due to the immune response rather than infection. Uh, again, that cytokine storm I mentioned. We also found that the percentage of immune deficient patients who got sick was the same percentage as the general population. And by sick, I, meant very, I mean very sick or severe. So in some ways, um, the early information, although it's a very, very small group of people, is somewhat reassuring that um, it, there aren't higher percentages of PI patients that are getting sick or they're not presenting in more severe forms. Now again, take that with a grain of salt, because as we learn more, that may change. So in some ways, it's, it's some reassurance. And again, the same is with the general population, that severe disease is more due to the immune response rather than the actual infection itself, um, which is the cytokine storm. So again, those at highest risk from our New York City data shows that by far the top three of, that had very, very severe disease and fatalities um, were obese, those with obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, now, lung disease, we were fearing was a risk factor, but interestingly enough, um, asthma was not in the top 10. And again, this is initial data over the last uh, four to eight weeks coming out of New York specifically. Um, however, you know, that doesn't mean you know, to drop your guard if you have asthma, you, know, you still should be vigilant. But it was interesting, it was an interesting observation. And that same observation was also seen in some of the data coming out of China, as well as Seattle. And again, we're still learning about the disease. But one thing that could be an interesting risk factor, which I didn't see a lot of data on personally, was if interstitial lung disease or bronchiectasis, which many PI patients have, could be still an issue. As we know, um, that is a risk factor in all infections and pneumonias in general. So that is something that we're still keeping an eye on and it will be interesting to see um, how that plays out as we get more information, not only just from PI patients, but from others that also have interstitial lung disease and bronchiectasis. Um, just theoretically or logically speaking, I would think that it would put you in a higher risk group because we do know that COVID-19 does affect, uh, affect the lungs more so than um, some other organ systems. And if you have a lower reserve, it could set you up to have a much more severe course of the disease. So treatments, you know, this has been a big topic of discussion um, along with, you know, the hope for a vaccine. So some promising treatments on the horizon, and I know it can be extremely confusing to navigate um, with the amount of media. I think they did an estimate of that just with COVID-19 alone, there's been over um, 1 billion media impressions and, and having so much media on one topic in such a short amount of time can be extremely overwhelming, especially when you're trying to navigate and hearing so much different conflicting data. So, you know, it's important to stay in touch with your physician, um, speak to those who do understand the data um, and, and be careful what you read or see. So what we know so far, uh, remdesivir, uh, which is one of the antiviral drugs that's been studied by um, the company Gilead, it has shown to have promise from initial data. But again, you know, we need more. Convalescent plasma as well has been shown to be helpful in studies coming out of China. 
Um, we don't have, and we have trials being uh, studied here in the U.S., but we don't have uh, concrete data yet here. But we do have uh, good significant data on both of those. And of course, we've been using anti-inflammatory treatments to combat that cytokine storm a lot of anti-IL-6 agents because IL-6 is believed to be the cytokine that is precipitating the release of, uh, you know, many other cytokines and inflammatory agents that can trigger this large in, uh, inflammation within the body. Um, hydroxychloroquine, even though it had a lot of attention initially um, from the media, from the government, um, has actually failed what we call randomized placebo-controlled trials. And, you know, whenever you're hearing about these studies, I would encourage you to look for those words, randomized placebo-controlled, because those are the studies that have the strongest strength to them. Um, and that is what we as doctors and scientists in the medical community look to, to see what actually uh, will work. Um, because, you know, none of these things are without side effects. So it's very, very important that, you know, you're not being treated or you may not be uh, taking or using something that isn't without risk and, and may not even have a benefit. So what is the deal uh, with testing? And what does it mean for PI patients? So just like with other illnesses, serological testing is not very accurate. Uh, on PI patients who may have antibody deficiencies or, on, or are on IVIG. Because again, if you have an antibody deficiency, we don't know yet if you will even be able to make um, antibodies or IgG um, to COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Uh, further, if you're getting monthly IVIG replacement, um, again, the serological testing is merely measuring somebody else's antibodies or donor antibodies. So um, this has been a big question, at least amongst my patients, um, who want to know if they've been exposed. And unfortunately, you know, it just isn't reliable, similar to other serologic tests. PCR testing is the most reliable. Um, however, even with this, we've seen a high number of false negative uh, rates as well, 30% um, in some cases. And again, there's so many different laboratories currently that are making both the antibody as well as the PCR test. So you do want to make sure um, that whatever testing that you're having done uh, is something that's reliable, that's accurate, um, and that there's good um, either FDA authorization or approval behind it. Uh, and then because of the theoretical risk of both increased infection and inflammatory outcomes, we still encourage the PI patients to stay hypervigilant. Um, the good news, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're not seeing infection rates higher in the PI population, but knowing that your immune system is weaker than most is uh, you know, reason enough. And I think most of PI patients are used to this. So um, you all may be better at social distancing, wearing the masks, um, taking you know, proper precautions than the general population. So um, in some ways you've been prepared for this. But, uh, and then the other side of it too, as many of you know, is that having a primary immune deficiency also sets you up ironically for having more inflammation in your body because your immune system is not only responsible for taking care of infections, but also inflammation. So many of our PI patients have autoimmune disease, and have this what we call a pro-inflammatory or pro-inflammation state. So for that reason too, we don't know quite yet, you know, could our PIP patients be more uh, susceptible to cytokine storm or is it the same as the general population? Uh, time will tell. So again, um, all of you I know are doing these things, but please continue to stay hypervigilant for those reasons. And again, I'll, I'll stop right there so you can digest. And I know um, Dr. Yanko has excellent information coming, especially his experience on the front lines. Um, but, you know, the one positive out of all of this is that, you know, I think all of us can agree, especially here in New York, we've seen a real sense of community. Um, I like this cartoon that was in the New Yorker a couple days ago because, you know, we're just seeing everybody come together, even though we're physically far apart. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's very heartwarming. People are spending more time with their families, um, you know, less time polluting the world. And, you know, we will get through this. Um, and, you know, all of you I know already are doing all the right things. And please continue to stay engaged um, with the IDF, with your physicians. Um, stick to reliable sources of information. Thank you so much, Dr. Parikh. That was wonderful.
Now, at this time, I would like to invite Lynette Strauss from CSL Bearing for a quick word from our sponsor. Well, thank you all so very much. On behalf of CSL Bearing, I would like to firstly thank all of the healthcare workers, uh, Dr. Parikh, for their truly heroic work. Um, and thank you also to IDF for putting this together and for inviting me and, and having CSL have the opportunity. I'm certainly looking forward to hearing from our valiant patients and, and for the opportunity to share some valuable resources that CSL Bearing offers. So without further ado, I uh, turn it back and look forward to getting started. Thank you, Lynette. Okay, now on to our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Art Anko, and he is going to speak about what comes next after COVID-19. Dr. Anko is a board certified allergist and immunologist who serves as assistant professor in the departments of medicine and pediatrics at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell and treats patients at Northwell Health. Welcome Dr. Anko. Hi everyone. Okay. So uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad I'm able to participate. Just as a little background, I did just come off serving in the COVID wards in uh, for Northwell Health. So as you guys know, I'm in New York. I, I'm in New York metro area, and so we were. I was taking care of patients in Queens, which is the borough with the highest number of COVID patients, as well as Long Island. So towards the end of the presentation, I'll share a little bit of some of my thoughts, having been a clinical immunologist day in, day out, working on the floors with COVID patients. So I think the biggest thing to remember is that, as Dr. Parikh mentioned earlier, there's still a lot of things that we're just not sure of um, when it comes to COVID. There's just insufficient information, but it's really still early days. So one of the things that we need to think about is just how, in, we really don't know just how infectious this virus is. This idea of the r not that I'm sure you guys have heard about, well, you know, the truth of the matter is it's a little bit dependent on the population we're talking about. How infectious or how transmissible a particular pathogen is depends on the population that we're talking about. So that remains to be worked out. The most current uh, estimates of that, you know, is, has been all over the place. And, you know, as we get more information, we'll have to see what we can do. The other thing that we need to work up, worry about, too, is the basic biology of the virus is still being worked out. So, um, you know, I think that there's more research that's being done. And as we understand the, the ins and outs of this virus, that's going to give insight into what we can do about it. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned working in, on the floors and really seeing the, the research that's coming out is we're only starting to scratch the surface about what, how the virus impacts the body of humans and, you know, our furry friends, too. Um, and the reason I bring that up is I went to medical school in the Bronx, and I'm sure you've all heard about the tigers that are now COVID positive at the Bronx Zoo. Um, and more recently, you know, now that domestic animals seem to also be developing um, COVID infections, what, that, what might that mean for PI communities, especially since a lot of us may have, you know, uh, furry friends at home too. Um, so I think we, there's a lot of information that's still missing in that. And Dr. Parikh also said that we were all so focused on what happens to the lungs, but there's a lot of evidence now that shows that COVID attacks all parts of the body. One of the things that we're learning at Northwell, um, some researchers from our group are the first to publish like over 5,000 patients and the impact of COVID on them is that, you know what, we never thought there were neurological impacts, that there were kidney impacts, blood clotting impacts. So we just need to really understand um, with over time how much information we don't know. Something that's of particular interest to the PI community is what about the development and maintenance of immunity? So as Dr. Parikh already mentioned, can, we, can patients, depending on their um, underlying PI, can they even um, mount a good immune response? What about serological testing? Just because you have IgG to COVID, does it mean that you're protected and will that protect you from future uh, infection? At this point in time, you know, we don't really know. And so with all these tests that are coming out in the market saying that they can tell you whether or not you have IgG to the COVID-19 virus or not, you just 
really want to think about it and speak to your uh, medical provider, whether or not uh, doing such testing is really worth your while and if what it really means for your health. Um, as also was mentioned by previous speakers, we really don't know about the optimal diagnosis and how to treat these problems. Um, right now, uh, a lot of the treatments, I think, are based on the best available evidence, but if we reanalyze the information weeks or months from now, our understanding might be different. So what we're doing today, what we did last week, what we did the week before, might not actually be the best way to manage and treat or diagnose even COVID-19 infection. We also really don't understand what the risk factors are. You know, we're all scratching our heads. Why is it that certain parts of the world, certain parts of the country have had a disproportionate um, impact on infections? In particular, you know, we all thought that pa patients with underlying lung conditions might be at higher risk, but the best available data right now, not so, it's not so clear that that's the case. Definitely obesity, definitely cardiac problems or heart problems, and definitely um, diabetes. Those, I think, are risk factors, but you know what? Just because there's not a lot of information on how COVID directly impacts the PI community, it doesn't mean that the PI community might not, you know, might not suffer the brunt of uh, COVID infections. And so we need to figure out when that, uh, when we have more information, how that's gonna happen. And then the, the thing I think as we look forward and as states reopen and we need to get back to some semblance of normal life is we really don't understand what the best practices will be for public health. And you know, the thing to remember is what might be reasonable um, practices for one, at, um, one part of the population may not be the same for all. And as Dr. Parikh also mentioned, patients with PI need to remain hypervigilant because you, there are things about your underlying medical conditions that can put you at higher risk than everyone else around you. So as we discussed, um, the current research says that there are some groups of folks who may be at higher risk. And so this is just a running list of what we seem to know based on the information that's been compli compiled by the CDC. So on their website, they clearly state people who are immunocompromised. Now, I want to put a little asterisk by that because on the CDC website, they do mention patients who have underlying PI, but they also mention other folks who have acquired immunodeficiency, such as HIV, and folks who are on immunosuppressive medications, um, such as, you know, people who have just recently had chemotherapy or, under, or, you know, or transplant recipients and stuff like that. We do know that... Um, older patients, especially age 65 and older, are at higher risk for developing severe illness from COVID-19. Why that is, we're not so sure, but if I had to make an educated guess, it's probably because, you know, the older we get, um, our immune system kind of doesn't work as well, and that could be a part of natural aging. And plus, as we get other medical conditions, which are more likely the older you get, you just don't have as much wiggle room or reserve. Um, we also know that folks who live in a nursing home or, are, or in some sort of long-term care facility have high, are, are at higher risk. And we don't know if there's something biological per se about the patients who are there because they're older, they're sicker, or if it's because, you know, because they're just much closer to each other, there's less opportunities to kind of for social distancing and to prevent the spread. Um, but we do know that patients of all ages, as long as they have an underlying medical condition, um, that could also put you at risk. Um, and these include people with chronic conditions, such as the diabetes, the heart disease, and um, the uh, obesity. So in the absence of like clear cut um, information, we really have to rely on what's available. And I think that as a good starting point, re, uh, relying on the CDC's recommendations is a good place to start. So what can you do to reduce your risk of getting sick with COVID-19? So if you are one of those uh, individuals with a chronic medical condition, um, you want to make sure you continue to take your meds and that you don't necessarily change your treatment plan without asking input from your medical providers. Um, and so it has been recommended that you have at least a two-week supply of your prescription and non-prescription medications. And then part of the reason for this is like if you have the meds that you need at home, then hopefully you won't need to venture out there and you're able to keep the social distancing and other kind of good hygienic practices that we're currently recommending. Um, so something that we tend to forget about or, you know, but we should keep at the forefront is you need to make sure you have an honest conversation with your healthcare provider about whether or not your vaccinations are up to date. 
So this is a little um, challenging for some patients in the PI community because some of us can't get certain types of vaccines or because we're getting IgG, we don't need to. But you, know, you just wanna make sure you're on the same page um, with your uh, medical providers about whether or not you need to get vaccinations. This is in particularly important if we have um, family members live with us who might be due for their vaccinations. And so you don't want their immunity, you don't want their overall health to take a hit because they're not doing routine ma preventive health care like vaccinations. And then if they get sick, then if you live in the same house with them, your risk also goes up um, as well. So one thing to forget, not to forget is, um, even though the hospitals are now starting to open up, for a while, hospitals were kind of telling people, if you do not have an emergency, don't necessarily show up in the emergency room or in the urgy care because we're being inundated by the COVID pa patients. I can tell you as of Friday, at least in our hospitals, the number of patients coming in for COVID has pre precipitously dropped. So we're starting to see all those patients who maybe were having heart attacks, asthma attacks, like all these patients who weren't going to get routine care and are now starting to show up because when they come, they're hopefully not going to be as exposed to the COVID. So you want to make sure that you always talk to your medical professionals if you have a medical condition that needs help, uh, needs attention. And really, I can't even reiterate, talk, now with the advent of telehealth, talking on the phone, your providers being more available to you, there's really no reason why you can't get some help, some medical care for your other medical problems apart from COVID, even though COVID is keeping you at home or not wanting to go to your doctor's offices and stuff like that. So what should you do if you think someone in your home might have been exposed? So what the CVD, CDC says is you should really self-monitor. So this is, um, it's important to say that the most common things, symptoms that we look out for are fever, cough, or shortness of breath. But most recently, CDC has kind of um, updated the kinds of symptoms that you should be watching out for. And so this table is probably going to be outdated now because things like loss of sen sense, sense of taste and smell are slowly filtering into the other signs and symptoms that you should think about. Um, so if you think you have been exposed, you should look for these things, um, take your temperature and, you know, take it upon yourself to practice the social dis distancing, which means, you know, really maintaining at least six foot feet of distance from between people and trying to stay out of crowded places if you can, okay? If you feel healthy, but had a recent close contact with a person with COVID-19, so somebody like me who's, I've been very fortunate that I've had no symptoms, but I've been working day in, day out, full, chock full of COVID around me. Uh, you know, we have, I have been taking my temperature at least twice a day, once in the morning before I go to work, and when I come back after I've decontaminated myself. Um, however, since I have not, you know, I have not had any symptoms and I have not had any positive testing. I haven't needed to self-quarantine myself. And we'll talk about what these things mean in, a, in, a, in the next couple of slides. But basically what it means is when you self-quarantine, you're going to stay home and not really travel for the next 14 days. And you continue to do the self-monitoring of the temperatures twice a day and watching out for symptoms. Um, you know, if there are other family members at home with you, like an elderly parent, somebody with other immune deficiency, then until you know what your status is, you should kind of stay away from, from those potentially high risk people who could catch it from you. Um, and then if you yourself have been diagnosed with infection through some test, most likely through a PCR test, or are you still waiting for your results, or you think you have some symptoms, you know, if you can, you should really self-isolate. So what does that mean? Self-isolating means, you know, you pick a place in your home, hopefully it's your bedroom, that it's really just you. And it'd be great if you can also have your own bathroom associated with that so that you're not you know, you don't have, if you can, don't share your bedroom, don't share your bathroom. But if you have to share the bathroom, at least, you know, after you use it, hopefully the next person who comes in will do a good job cleaning up after, making sure the counters are clean, you know, the, the, the handles, the doorknobs have all been disinfected. 
um, and then you know kind of keeping things as clean as possible and here is where CDC says if possible you should also stay away from any household pets um, if you think you're in this situation where you know you're COVID-19 positive is just because we're so unsure how how high transmission is from humans to their furry neighbors and furry friends so that it's better safe than sorry um, so you know if you know that you're COVID-19 positive, you really should be doing all the self-isolation from your human family members and your fam uh, furry family members. So, you know, as we mentioned before, even though we don't have the end-all be-all information, that means we can't not do something about it. We have to act. So action is needed despite inadequate information. So, uh, we've had to rely on tried and true public health measures, which means, you know, we try our best to minimize and prevent exposure however we can. And so we talked about the social distancing, we talked about self-isolation, and we also talked about quarantining, if self-quarantining if needed. And we also talk a little bit about the use of personal protective equipment. This is a very contentious issue, and the proper PPE depends on Kind of what you do in life. So the PPE for a medical professional, a first responder, is different when they're on the job doing what they're doing than it would be for like a, a member of the general population or a member of the PI population or some other population at risk. Uh, regardless, we should always practice good hygiene. And so if you go to the CDC website, they teach you about you know, coughing into your tissue, coughing into your elbow, and then quickly doing hand hygiene after that, frequent hand washing with soap and water, and if you can't do soap and water immediately, at least doing an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, that's at a minimum 60 to 70 percent alcohol. Frequent, doing it frequently and often is the best practice. Um, and then we can also talk a little bit about contact tracing, linkage to services because as we as the pandemic kind of shifts to a different um position you know it's a different timeline now um everyone is, uh, to the best of our knowledge the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic seems to be kind of on the down slope but that doesn't mean we won't have more uh episodes in the future most likely so uh, us developing our, our government, state, local, and federal governments developing the infrastructure to make sure that when somebody turns positive, we can contact all the folks that they've been in contact with and link them up with appropriate testing services, whatever else they might need, or in your family, if there's somebody, you know, making sure that you have the support you need for elder care, child care, whatnot, that all needs to still be worked out. Um, the thing that we're starting to realize, though, is that our current public health infrastructure may not be up to the task. And, you know, unfortunately, even though there's a federal government, a lot of this public health structure infrastructure falls on state and local governments. And we all know that they're all at different levels of preparedness. And so, you know, it would not be surprising to find that some states are going to do a better job and some municipalities are going to do a better job at this kind of um, you know, contact tracing and linkages to services than other places. Um, so it's unfortunate, but it's a work in progress. So how do we minimize and prevent exposure? So quarantine really is to keep somebody who might have been exposed to COVID, to, to the virus away from others. And so that's fundamentally different from isolation, which is, you know, you know that one of you is sick, and so you don't you want to keep them away from healthy people who aren't sick yet. And so, you know, the use of social distancing as that like little cartoon implies, it's, you know, keeping away from each other for at least six feet. And you see that these, these individuals are also wearing the face masks. Um, so that's going to be important. Um, and why do we need to do social distancing? And, and the graph I put up here is just one of many that we've seen. But really, um, if there's no protective measures in place, we're going to see a much higher peak of infections, a number of cases. However, if we can flatten the curve because we're doing something proactive by kind of minimizing the numbers of exposures and preventing exposure, then that's really going to be helpful. But if you see that dotted line, once again, the, the reality is how well we do these things depends on how integrated the healthcare and how prepared the health system, the healthcare system that's taking care of this population is. And it seems like from, from what we've seen, 
each state, each state is different. So depending on where you live, um, the infrastructure may be more ready to take care of you and the epidemic around you. So how, because we need to protect ourselves and protect others, the best thing, you know, it's best to err on the side of caution. So you want to continue the appropriate use of personal protective equipment, of PPE. So currently CDC does not recommend the use of surgical masks or N95 masks by lay people. Um, so however, you know, this, this might vary state by state. So the N95 masks are what healthcare providers use because that can um, significantly diminish the chance of virus getting into the person who's wearing its mucous membrane, so inside their nose and their mouth. Um, a surgical mask, like what's pictured here, you know, like the little paper mask that people wear or that uh, hook around the sides of your ears, that really doesn't protect the virus from getting inside that person. What it does do is prevent that person's germs <laughs> from spreading out. So that's why it's so important. So, so remember, different masks accomplish different things. Um, the CDC does say to use cloth face coverings when possible. And, you know, in New York State right now, everyone out in public should be wearing some sort of face covering if you are unable to practice social distancing. And if you're in the city, it's going to be really tough to do social distancing. So that basically means you should have some sort of face covering at all times. And don't forget to wash your face coverings. Now, if it's a fabric based uh, face covering, then of course you can wash it. But if it's not, you should probably look at the manufacturer. Or uh, manufacturer's instructions or it's probably something you want to replace on a regular basis. So how should you wear a face cloth covering? You know it should fit snugly but comfortably against the side of the face. You make want to make sure that you can secure it with either ear loops or ties so that it fits nice and tight on your face. If you're making one yourself or if you're purchasing one, you want to make sure that there are multiple layers of fabric because that just means that there are more barriers for your germs to have to cross through and so it can help better prevent the spread of infection. But you want to make sure that it also allows for breathing without restrictions and you want to make sure that you care for it. So you should wash it um, and make sure you dry it and after you wash and dry it that it doesn't compromise the quality of the mask. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of um, guides on the CDC website and other places on how to DIY your cloth face mask. Um, what I would just say is before you use it, make sure that like you check with the CDC to make sure that it follows kind of like their recommendations because on their website, they definitely have uh, recommendations um, for it. So what about gloves? So um, gloves can be a double-edged sword um, because they can give you a false sense of security you know, if you wear your gloves, but you're not mindful about how you're using it, where you're putting your hand, your gloved hands, you, they can get contaminated pretty easily, especially in the outside. And so if you're, you know, if you're wearing gloves, but then you're touching everything around you and you're still like touching your hair, your face, your mouth, can actually end up spreading the virus more easily because you have this false sense of security that you're protecting yourself. So the most important thing is if you're gonna use gloves, you should use them properly you should assume that everything around you is contaminated unless otherwise stated, unless you, you yourself like took it out of the packaging. Um, and you need to make sure you practice proper removal and we'll go over that in a minute. And the last part is you need to make sure you get rid of those contaminated gloves properly. It disgusts people and it just, including me when I'm walking around everywhere and I see the gloves just everywhere. You know, that's just, that's, it's unsightly and it's unhygienic and it just spreads more infection. You still need to do hand hygiene after, even if you're using gloves regularly. So once again, washing with soap and water and for, you know, and singing your happy birthday song is still the best way to do it. Or at least uh, if you can't do that, use the alcohol-based sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. So there is technique to how to put on and remove your gloves. So, you know, not we we don't recommend that you wear sterile gloves that you would like if you're going into a surgery and you're the surgeon even if you just have a box of gloves so you want once you put them on like i said assume everything is contaminated until you're ready to get rid of them so you want to grasp the outside of one glove at the wrist making sure you're never touching the the bare skin the inside of the glove um, you want to pull off that first glove away from your body and as you're doing so you're pulling it inside out Right, the outside 
touchy part of the glove is what's contaminated, but the inside hopefully is not. Once you hold the glove, you just removed it, you keep that rolled up inside out gloved hand, uh, uh, glove in the gloved hand, and then you take your now clean ungloved hand and carefully insert it into the other glove and you kind of do the same thing again or you move it down inside out so now at the end of the day you have the last glove inside out with the original glove bolt inside and then you dispose of that into the trash can not on the floor not on the side and then you do hand hygiene which is if you can soap and water if not the hand sanitizer so just some thoughts. That's me when I was in the hospital, all gowned up. And, um, you know, see that the N95 mask is the little kind of um, uh, oval shape mask that's directly in my face. And then we have the paper surgical mask on top of that. You see, I was also wearing the eye protection and then the face shield on top of that because nobody wants anything splattered on you. And then the head covering. And then Underneath that, I had my paper scrubs on top of my regular scrubs, and then the yellow gown with the double gloves. So like I said, when I was treating patients on the COVID floors, there was just so much we didn't know. The treatments that we're doing in week one were not the treatments that we were doing by the time I left the service on Friday. Um, you know, even hydroxychloroquine, we stopped using that, I think like week two, just because the data showed that it wasn't that helpful. Um, we need to understand that COVID-19 testing is not perfect. As Dr. Parikh mentioned, even with the PCR test, we can, in some instances, you can have a 30% negative result. So, and then like if you do the, um, the antibody test on those folks, they're positive. So that, so which of the tests is wrong? The original PCR or the, the blood test? What's most likely is, you know, the PCR test. You really have, I hate to say it, but when you put that sterile Q-tip up inside the nose, you really have to shove it pretty far up. So if the person doing the test is not very good at it, the, the operator issue is what gives you a lot of the false negatives. Um, and without a doubt, many folks will get COVID-19, but not everyone will have serious disease. You know what? The majority of patients that we don't hear about are the ones who are at home recovering and who are like, self-isolating but you know if you test but you know they they didn't have severe respiratory problems that required them to go to hospital they didn't need oxygen they didn't need all the medications that uh, we're talking about the IL-6 blockers the hydroxychloroquine the um, antiviral medications they were you know they felt sick they felt crappy but they stayed at home and they made a recovery um, so and I, do, I also want to make sure that people remember, we have to think critically about all the information we're getting. Not every infor, source of information is credible. Um, you know, places like even the science that we're hearing about, you want to take with a grain of salt. Because one of the exciting but also disturbing trends we've seen is all this information about treatment. Um, and treatment outcomes are being published before they undergo rigorous evaluation through peer review. And so, you know, normally in the scientific process, when somebody makes a discovery and they submit that paper of their findings to a journal, it can take weeks to months for scientists and doctors and other experts in the field to kind of really go through the research and say, do we believe that this is really here? But here you're getting people just you know, saying, oh, this is our finding and we're gonna put it out there and then people act on that appropriately or inappropriately. So think critically about the information. Um, we really don't know if we're gonna develop long lasting immunity. Um, the last time I looked, there were at least two, maybe even three or four different strains of SARS-CoV-2 that have been identified. We're not sure if the same strain is what's circulating in all the different parts of the world or when we do the testing, we're not differentiating between the different SARS strains, uh, SARS-CoV-2 strains. So it could be that some of the people who were sicker had a fundamentally different type of virus that infected them. Who knows? We need to figure that out still. And then will COVID-19 vaccines be safe for the PI patients? That's a really important question. And if we go to the next slide, I'll just give you a flavor of what kind of things are under development. So right, so this is a, a review from a recent uh, Nature paper, which shows that there are over 50 different types of vaccines under development by different entities and different companies, different academic institutions and research groups. Now, as you can see, 
vaccines can be inactivated or dead vaccines, but there can also be live uh, weakened or attenuated virus vaccines. So as you can see here, um, if, as you look at this graph, if you start on the left-hand side, those are still kind of like in the experimental preclinical research stage. And as you move towards the right, the phase one trials are in clinical trials. So for patients with PI, for patients with cellular immune problems like people with SCID or combined immunodeficiency, it might not be safe to give them live attenuated or live weakened virus vaccines, right? We try to avoid those for those patients. So as you can see, some of the leading candidates for a a COVID vaccine fall into that kind of category. Um, thankfully, there are other groups that are looking at kind of dead or DNA or RNA-based RNA um, um, vaccines. So, you know, patients with PI, even patients with cellular immunodeficiency might be able to safely receive, um, you know, nucleotide, uh, nucleic acid-based vaccines or peptide-based vaccines. So, I mean, I think that the fact that there's a whole gamut of different types of vaccines that are under investigation will hopefully mean that there will be options for all types of people, people with PI, people with other kinds of medical conditions, and then hopefully all of them will be effective so that we'll all get protected. I think that's my last slide. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Anko. That was wonderful information. Um, anybody that has questions, continue to um, send them to me via the chat. Um, before I continue, though, I would like to invite Natalie Leveroni from Karoo for a quick word from our sponsor. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Anko and all of the healthcare workers on the front lines. Um, Koru Medical Systems is located about an hour and a half north of New York City. So we are thankful to be an essential business manufacturing our, our pumps, our product, and um, keeping our workers safe and, and healthy. And thank you again, um, for IDF for bringing us all together when we're far apart. Um, it's good to, to be able to get together as a community and continue to learn. So I thank all of you and I am happy to be here. Thank you, Natalie. And again, you will hear more from Natalie in um, our virtual exhibit hall tonight. So now at this time, Dr. Parikh and um, Dr. Anko will be answering questions related to COVID-19 and the PI community. So each of our presenters will take turns answering the questions. And to give you um, just a couple seconds here to enter any um, additional questions into the chat that you might have, um, we are going to um, start out with some pre-submitted questions that and um, if we don't get to your question tonight, don't worry, we will post it on the IDF website in the upcoming days. You'll get an email about that. And um, because we were a little bit concerned that Dr. Anko might be um, stuck in the COVID unit, we do have the first few um, questions to be answered by you, Dr. Parikh. So Dr. <laughs> Anko, you can take a little break for a second here. <laughs> First question, Dr. Parikh, does the flu shot or pneumonia vaccine provide any protection against COVID-19? Right, so that is a great question. Um, unfortunately, neither vaccine uh, provides any protection against COVID-19 uh, because it's a completely different uh, infection altogether. So flu shot and pneumonia vaccine are still very, very important, even though we're in a pandemic because flu is still around. Um, people are still being hospitalized from the flu and the same goes for uh, bacterial pneumonia. So you should still get those shots, but unfortunately they don't do much for COVID-19. Thank you. Next question. Can UV light and or heat kill COVID-19? All right, so this is a very good question. Um, there's been some data, again, as we've been saying, the common theme throughout this talk, please take all data with a grain of salt, um, that UV light may be able to reduce how long the virus can live on various surfaces, but again, uh, we don't have strong data to support that. 
So uh, I would not rely on UV light or heat alone. Um, there's also been some thoughts where, oh, and once summer comes, the virus will go away. Uh, that's very unlikely that that will happen because we know that very warm areas of the world are also seeing increasing cases of COVID-19, such as Florida um, and Arizona and Southern California. So we, we can't rely on that assumption. So again, uh, for now, you know, keep doing all the things that we're doing, social distancing, hand hygiene, um, and being very vigilant. Thank you. Next question. Now that masks may be required when in public, what mask should I wear to prevent from getting the virus? Right, so you know, for the general public, what we've been saying, and Dr. Anko also had touched upon it, you know, the N95 masks um, or medical grade masks, we are trying to reserve for um, our healthcare workers, especially those on the front lines, um, because we know that um, PPE is far and few between, you know, and, and unfortunately our healthcare workers are at much higher risks of getting sick uh, from the virus. Um, what we're recommending in general uh, is that, you know, homemade masks are good. The main thing is make sure that it covers your nose and your mouth. Cloth masks are also okay. Um, the CDC has excellent recommendations. The important thing is when you come home, make every time you come home, make sure you wash your mask before using it again. Um, now, I know that immune deficient patients are more immune compromised than the average person. So it depends too on the severity of your immune deficiency. Um, you may want to have uh, more protection than just a homemade mask. And I do encourage you to discuss that with your physician because as you know, we just mentioned there's more than 400 different types. Uh, and presumably if you are staying home, again, I, I don't suspect that you should need a medical grade mask, but you know, there's always exceptions to the rules. So again, please reserve um, N95s and those for the healthcare workers but everybody at this point, we are recommending masks. Thank you, next question. As things open up, do people with PI need to isolate themselves for a longer period of time? Um, also an excellent question. So I would say the short answer is yes. Um, we don't know for how much longer, but you know, as things open up, I think everything needs to be done gradually uh, because we don't know uh, what will happen. And the last thing that we want is to have a second wave uh, or a second surge, as they say. Um, just learning from history 100 years ago when we had the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, sadly it was the second wave that was even worse than the first one because people let their guards down too quickly, um, you know, and as we know, these viruses sometimes can mutate. As Dr. Anko said, there might be more than one strain. So, um, you know, for a P for my PI patients, I am telling them, you know, prepare to, um, you know, wait a little longer than the general population. We want to make sure it's absolutely safe. Thank you. Next question. Um, in an area like New York City, is it safe to walk outside or is COVID-19 in the air? Right. So this has also been a very hot topic because as the weather warms up, more people are outside. You're going to the parks. Um, and uh, many people actually even over the weekend were not social distancing, sadly. Uh, we were seeing, you know, photos all over the media, of people grouping together. So um, this is very important and even underscores the need for wearing a mask when you do go outside because one, in some areas, it might be hard to social distance. Uh, for example, if you're walking past someone or running past someone, if you're trying to get exercise, it's very hard uh, to constantly keep six to 10 feet of distance. Um, the other thing too, is that we do have some reports that uh, the virus may be airborne. And that's another reason too we're recommending wearing the mask. So again, we are, we're not saying don't go outside. It's, it's very good to get fresh air. Uh, it's very good to get exercise, but please do so safely. So I would pick areas that are not densely populated, wear your mask, um, you know, just use common sense techniques to um, keep yourself isolated even when outdoors. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Anko, don't get too comfortable. It's your turn now. <laughs> but Dr. Parikh, leave your microphone on because, you know, we, we'll probably go back and forth. Okay. Um, Dr. Anko, when will COVID-19 antibodies be in the plasma that we receive? 
<laughs> Interesting you guys should ask that. There was a recent preprint, so it means hasn't been evaluated by the normal peer review process, paper that was posted. So a group from Mount Sinai in the city tested some commonly available IgG products out there and they found no evidence of any anti-COVID-19 protection or antibodies, IgG, in those common preps, which kind of makes sense, right? We don't know when COVID started um, circulating in the, in the population, so there's no reason to believe that the folks who donate their blood so that we can have IgG products are also going to be protected against it. Um, you know, until, so it's not, we're not sure when we're going to start being able to detect uh, COVID-19 in the IgG preps, but now that we have tests for them, I'm sure moving forward, um, there's going to be interest in checking to see if the IgG products moving forward are going to be offering any protection. But once again, is it, is it, does having IgG to COVID translate to you being protected from it? that basic fundamental biology question still needs to be answered successfully. So let's, let's, the word is, not, the word is uh, still out there. We need to figure out what it means. Um, we'll have you take, carry on with this one. Um, in terms of herd immunity, any ideas about what time frame we might be looking for there? So once again, this goes back to our lack of information that the idea of that are not, so how infectious and how transmissible this is, that can influence the, the degree of herd immunity you have to have in the population. So, you know, you know, for a, a disease that has very high infectivity or hand, high transmission, then a, a super high proportion of the population needs to be immune, like 95 to 99% of that population. For a disease that isn't so transmissible, then you can have lower levels of herd immunity and still have reasonable protection. So because we don't really have a good sense of how that is, or what that is for um, COVID-19, it's gonna be hard to predict what level of protection in, in the community or in the population are we gonna need to, ha to have reasonable herd immunity. Um, you know, so I think that, and then once again, different areas, different populations in the world will probably have different requirements for herd immunity, just because the disease unfolds differently in different populations. So I think, once again, we need a little bit more information before we can start, uh, you know, making estimates or guesses about herd immunity and stuff like that. Thank you. A couple more questions. Dr. Parikh, um, if you're receiving IG therapy now, um, how does it, how would it interact with COVID-19? Help fight it, make it worse, no impact. Right, so again, um, we don't know for sure, but we're, you know, the thought is that having uh, more normal or functional antibodies might be helpful in fighting infections in general. Now we know that there, uh, I, IgG or IVIG is more helpful with bacterial infections, but there is data that it helps with viral infections too. So. Um, you know, as it was mentioned before, you should be continuing your infusions, um, you should be stopping your treatment. Hopefully, once we understand more about the immunity, and once we start having IVIG in the donor pool um, that has COVID-19 antibodies, we're hoping that will confer some immunity that way too. Got um, two more questions here. And um, there were several about returning to work. And um, once shelter in place is lifted and you return to work and you have PI, um, is six feet enough? Is your cloth mask enough? Um, you know, how should, um, how hypervigilant should we be? Um, so I, I I would say that um, I think we can't live in a bubble. So you're going to have to really think about in your particular work area, what are the risks to you? Do you know, you know, if you hear that somebody in the office just recently tested positive, then that risk is going to be much higher than in somebody where there's no known COVID exposures. I think that, you know, you're going to have to see what common sense um, measures you can follow. I think that, you know, wearing a mask 
and frequent hand hygiene would be reasonable things to do. Um, if you can get away with the social distancing, which might not always be realistic, then if you can't do that, then definitely wearing the masks uh, all, you know, all the time would be more important. Um, you know, the more kind of practices you can use is probably better. Um, also, you know, we need to keep track of what, what's happening of the, with the disease in the community that we live in. If you live like in a community where there's very little transmission, then, you know, the risk to you in, in particular and to your, to your workplace is going to be lower than in, say, somebody like New York City or Metro New York, where we can't social di distance. There was so much disease going on in the community, especially the this whole idea of the asymptomatic <laughs> people who are can still pass on the virus to folks, but might not have the outward appearance or the symptoms. Like we don't have a good understanding how how many of those people are really out in the community, and so those are kind of the silent threats that we need to account for. And so if you're wearing your mask, doing frequent hand washing, you can have the walls around your cubicle that are at least six feet. Those are probably, and if you can kind of work remotely as much as you can, then those are the things that you can, that are under your control, hopefully, to minim, mitigate your risk. Thank you. Dr. Parikh, last question. And we've had a lot of questions come in in the last few minutes, honestly. We are copying them and we'll follow up and let you know when um, they're posted on our website. Um, last question, in terms of children with PI going back to school, of course, we don't know when schools are going to open um, or going off to college. We don't know when those are going to open, but any, any advice for, for parents as these things start to happen? Right, so that, that's also a very good question. So again, um, the one good news regarding this virus is that it seems for the most part, um, children have had a much better outcome. Uh, even those that are immune compromised, we've been seeing that they also have had a much better outcome. So that includes um, children of PI, um, children who may um, have cancer and are on immune suppressive agents. Um, but that being said, you know, we are seeing some cases of children um, with severe, more severe disease, you know, even here in New York. So again, I think that will have to be um, a case by case basis because, you know, every PI patient is different and their severity of immune compromise is different as well too. So, you know, if it were my patient asking this question or their parent, I would say, you know, we, we would have to evaluate uh, each PI patient based on um, their immune deficiency. So whether they have a, you know, a combined immune deficiency where their B and T cells are affected or an antibody deficiency um, versus CVID. So it, it's a very, I think, personalized decision. But it, it's a good question and we're gonna have to answer it sooner rather than later. Thank you, thank you so much. So now, um, thank you. Thank you to our wonderful presenters who have volunteered their time during this very challenging period um, in our lives for being here tonight and just being amazingly wonderful. Um, thank you. And if we could give you a hand, we would. Okay, so now at this time, I would like to invite um, Sean McCabe and Dana Flathammer from Takeda for a quick word from our sponsor. Hi, thank you, Catherine. Um, and a sincere thanks again on, on behalf of really everyone, quite frankly, with Dr. Parikh and Anko for the heroic uh, work that you guys do every day, and then most importantly, servicing this community. Uh, in the spirit of community, uh, a thanks as well to the IDF for developing, I think, really apropos and relevant content uh, for the community in, in adapting to the needs and, and hosting these in this virtual setting. So sincere thanks, John and Catherine, for your great coordination. Um, and speaking of adapting, just in, in representing one of many manufacturers uh, of, of plasma and derivatives, Really proud to see what we're doing uh, as an industry in a lot of respects. Uh, we've partnered up with, with many in the industry. CSL is on the, on the phone today. I know they're part of an alliance that we partnered with to develop scale uh, to the development of a potential solution as well. And again, a, a lot more to go. Um, but at the same time, just really, really great to see people joining together around the humanitarian effort. Um, and I guess my only direction to, the, to those listening is, 
So make sure you're reaching out to your manufacturers. Um, it's your voice that matters to us, and we know only what we're told in terms of what needs are. And so things around patient, assist, patient assistance, nurse training, virtual needs, um, all great to hear, and we're looking forward to in our breakouts, uh, addressing any questions or needs as well. But looking forward to that voice. And again, thank you. And, and Dana Flathammer um, is a, a peer that helps support uh, the, the, the community. She leads our community support team. She'll also be joining me in the breakout. So thank you. Sorry. Okay, thank you so much. Now I would like to um, hand over the show to our president and CEO, John G. Boyle. Thanks, John. Well, thanks, Kathy, and uh, thanks so much to our presenters. And uh, for those of you who have eagle eyes, have noticed that uh, I'm no longer in the well-lit uh, home office that I have because it is late and I have a child and it is bedtime, I have been uh, relegated uh, to a not so well lit place, which I am going to work on for the next one. But uh, as everyone knows, uh, we're used to uh, dogs, cats, our furry friends. We are concerned about COVID-19 with Dr. Anko uh, and children uh, photobombing and, and just adapting, as was said before, to uh, new circumstances. So. Um, once again, thank you uh, to Dr. Parikh and Dr. Anko. Uh, we would not be able to uh, provide this sort of level uh, of information and insights uh, without your partnership. Um, so uh, moving right along here, I do want to uh, make a couple plugs uh, here for IDF and some other resources if you are new uh, to our community that you may not be as familiar with. Um, we have uh, an enormous number of uh, printed materials that are all, of course, available online as PDFs, uh, including our newly updated uh, IDF Patient and Family Handbook uh, for Primary Immunodeficiency Diseases, uh, the sixth edition. Um, it is uh, incredibly easy uh, to access and to download, and it is a uh, uh, just a, a resource unlike any other uh, out there that is uh, really made with our patients and families in mind. Uh, so it is a publication for our community, not a big uh, dusty medical tome, uh, and we hope and we think that you will enjoy it. Um, in addition to the, uh, the sort of resources that we provide uh, uh, in that sense, we also provide other resources such as support. And so uh, we hope that you'll uh, take a look if you're not familiar with our various uh, support programs. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I also want to suggest that everyone checks out uh, Ask IDF. Uh, if you have not uh, already, if you have a question, uh, you want to discuss something about uh, your insurance, uh, about, uh, you know, finding a medical professional, uh, where on the IDF's website to do that, just go to Ask IDF, uh, and a member of our team will help to direct you. Um, also, uh, as you are uh, planning for the, uh, the, the future after this meeting finishes up, uh, if you are interested in uh, additional uh, programming such as this, uh, we're going to have uh, another uh, one of these uh, meetings with a slightly different uh, group of presenters and topics. Uh, they'll be coming up uh, this Thursday on uh, the, uh, the 5th, I'm sorry, the uh, 7th of uh, May. And uh, it's going to be uh, from 6 p.m. Pacific time, not uh, Eastern. So uh, the night owls among uh, in here uh, will hopefully be well served. So um, if you have questions, go to Ask IDF. If you want resources, go to primaryimmune.org. Uh, and we hope that you will uh, uh, join us uh, for the San Francisco uh, uh, event, uh, if that is possible. So I uh, just appreciate uh, everyone who has been a part of this, uh, uh, th this experiment, uh, this uh, endeavor, and we hope that you've learned something. And one last time, uh, may the 4th be with you. I hope that you have a great evening. I hope you learned something, and I hope that we will see you again online. And uh, uh, and some point down the road, I hope we'll all see each other in person. So uh, stay safe, stay healthy, talk to your doctor, and um, and we will see each other very soon. Have a great night, everyone. Bye bye.